what you hear today. This is wonderful to have a full house when it comes to studying the scriptures. That's great. So we bless you. And as you know, we are studying Hebrews. And today we are in our second session, and we are going to be talking about how Jesus is better than the prophets and the angels. Last week we talked about the fact of the introduction to the book, and we found out that Jesus is God. And in the first three verses of chapter one, uh, the author, who he is, told us that Jesus is God. That and then he gave us seven different ways that we can know, that we can see that he's God. First of all, that he took all things have been given to him as an inheritance. And he, he, you know, he made the universe, he sustains the universe, he is the exact representation of who God is, he is the radius, the, the light of who God is shines out from him, and he provided salvation for us, and when it was finished, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. All things that only God could do. So when these things are attributed to Jesus, we know Jesus is God. And we talked last week about the fact that this book was written to Jewish believers, people who had converted from Judaism to Christianity, which was a very difficult thing to do in the first century, as you can imagine. All, they were surrounded by Jewish people. They were surrounded by the, all of the trappings of Judaism, keeping the law, all of the. So when they made the decision to convert to Christianity and to accept Jesus as their Messiah, it was a very difficult move for them. And they were persecuted for their faith, and it made them want to withdraw in their faith. And so the author wrote this book to say, no, 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 you can't withdraw. Jesus is the real deal. He is superior to anything else. And so each week, for the next few weeks, we're going to be seeing how that Jesus is superior in different ways. Today, we're going to see that he is superior to the angels. But before we begin today, we have, I'm going to show you a little video that my daughter Kristen uh, introduced me to a, a website called imetmessiah.com. And in this video, you will meet a Jewish man who has become a believer in Jesus Christ. And each week, I'm going to be showing you one of these. And I hope that the, the idea is, by showing these to you, that maybe you'll feel a little more attuned with the audience to whom this was written. Because it was written to people just like the man that you're going to see right now. We hope. <laughs> Here's what you need to do. You've got to first shave your head. You dress all in black. You've got to wear a white robe. Eat only kosher foods. You've got to become a vegetarian. You face Jerusalem. You've got to face India when you pray. You pray only in Hebrew and you grow a nice big beard. And if you do all of those outward cultural things, you'll discover the God of the universe. And I'm thinking this is crazy that someone thinks that they can force their culture on God and that God's going to be impressed by what you wear, what direction you face when you pray, what you eat, and all these sorts of things. It seemed to me that if there was a God out there who could be known, he should be able to be recognized no matter where I face, no matter how I'm dressed, because he's God. Growing up, we always understood that we had our Bible, and the Gentiles had their Bible, the New Testament, and that they were two completely separate books. Because the only people I knew who were believers in Jesus were all people in our public school who were Italian Catholic, I imagined that Jesus was Italian. And so the understanding that he's actually Jewish was, was a shock. And then to hear that the New Testament was written by Jews, I, I couldn't believe it. My expectation was that the New Testament 
was like my grandparents had told me. It was a, a book on how to persecute the Jews and something you should stay away from. Of course, when you're told you should stay away from something, <laughs> curiosity gets the best of you and you've got to see it. When I opened the New Testament, I was expecting to find a handbook on how to persecute the Jews. My grandparents had warned me that it was written by people who killed the Jews. That's what I was expecting to see, and yet when I'm opening it, I'm reading a story written by Jews about Jewish people. The New Testament was a fascinating book. And so as I opened this book in the library, I kind of looked around, made sure that none of my friends had seen me taking a Christian Bible off the shelf. And I open it, here's the first sentence. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So three people are mentioned and they're all Jewish. I was very shocked. And as I continue to read, I'm reading the story of a Jewish man who was born in a Jewish village, in a Jewish country, and one day walks into a synagogue and announces that he is the Messiah. The more I read the words of Jesus, the more I became attracted to him. It was as beautiful as anything I had ever read in any other part of the Bible. As I came to faith that Yeshua, that Jesus was the Messiah, it was clear that that was the most Jewish thing I could do. This is not a person who's a renegade to our people. This is the one who was promised in our Bible, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It is astonishing. If you would just read that chapter, just without the Bible being around it, you would say, oh, this is some Christian Bible. This is Jesus. <laughs> when you realize, though, that it's in the middle of our Bible, our Jewish Bible, when I first came to faith, I dared not tell my father uh, because this is a time period in the, the 1970s when there were lots of gurus and cults. And he was very concerned about me getting involved in some crazy sect and going off someplace. So I waited for months. And uh, when I finally told him, he was very skeptical. On his own then, he started to read about Jesus as well. About a year and a half later, I told him that the fellow who wrote one of the books that he had read, that this fellow was giving a lecture in the city in New York. And he agreed to come out to hear that person. And uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life was, the speaker said, would everyone here who is a Jewish believer in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I raised my hand. My father also raised his hand. And I said, I looked over and I said, Pop, he didn't say would all the Jews raise their hand. He said, would all the Jewish believers in Jesus raise their hand? And my father looked over and he said, yes, I, I heard what he said. The decision to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah was not something that was a momentary lark. It wasn't something that was a passing fad. And I could see changes in myself that I knew were not from within myself. I had kind of tapped in to a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful. Messiah.com. I met Messiah. Yeah, no doubt. I met Messiah.com. Now we're going to be seeing one each week, but you can look them up. I I will warn you ahead of time. Ron and I have both found this site absolutely addicting. Mm -hmm. I have listened to nearly all of the testimonies there, 70 maybe, mm -hmm. and because I was trying to choose the ones that we were going to use in our studies, but both of us say this is addicting. <coughs> Once you start, you don't just look at one. You want to see the next one because they're absolutely amazing stories of people who read the Bible and understand, or read the Bible or have a Christian friend and they see the difference in their lives. So like I told you last week, people don't reject Jesus because they have read the Bible. They reject Jesus because they have not read the Bible. And they don't understand the amazing thread of redemption in pictures of Jesus that goes from thousands of years before his birth until it culminates in the life of Jesus on earth. And when they see that, you have to say, this can't just happen. Nobody can make 1,500, 2,500 years 
of pictures and shadows and prophecies come true after they're born. It had to be gone, and Jesus is inside. So we're going to be looking at these testimonies each week. I'm at Messiah.com. As soon as you open it, it will change to a website that says oneforisrael.org. But don't look up oneforisrael.org. Look up I'm at Messiah because it will take you exactly to the page that has the testimonies. You'll see them right there. In fact, that's the first one. And you'll see his picture there. So you'll know you're in the right place. Now, as like I said, I, we want to see these so that we can understand a little bit better each week about the audience to whom this book was written, because they were facing persecution for, this answer, for their faith, for believing in Jesus. And so many of them were pulling back from their faith because of this, because they didn't want to face the pain, the suffering that their faith was bringing to them. And so one of the things that they were slipping into was the worship of angels. You see, angels, the Jewish people, and in Acts 7 and Galatians chapter 3, it tells us that angels were involved in the giving of the law, the law of Moses. Well, you know, the law of Moses is the most important thing to Jewish people, keeping the law. Their whole religion is wrapped around keeping the law of Moses. And so that made angels very important to them. And so they began worshiping angels. And the author writes this book to say, no, no, no. Jesus is the one we're to worship, not angels. And he shows how angels are superior. I mean, Jesus is superior to angels, even though angels are important. And the Old Testament had an as number of, of stories where angels played an important part. For example, when the people were leaving Egypt, when Israel was leaving Egypt and they were going to, uh, to go to the new land of Moses, God said in Exodus 23, I am sending an angel ahead of you who will protect you as you travel. He will lead you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to the angel and obey him. My power is in him. And then, you remember the story about Elijah the prophet when he had the contest on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, and they were deceived, asked the fire to come down from heaven, and the fire that came down from heaven and destroyed the sacrifice either of the prophets of Baal or Elijah, the true prophet of God, whichever one could call down the fire, they would, they would win the contest and their God would be God. Well, Elijah won. The fire came down from heaven, even though he surrounded his altar with water. And then after that, uh, Elijah, after that huge victory, Elijah, the prophet of God, got scared. He got scared of the king, Ahab, Queen um, Jezebel, and scripture tells us that he ran down the mountain, he ran and ran, and he got sat down under a broom tree, absolutely exhausted, and wanted to die. And while he was there, angels ministered to him and brought him food and water until he could recover. We also remember the story of Elisha the prophet and when they were the, the Israelites were facing certain defeat by their enemy, and Elisha said, "No, wait, look!" And God opened their eyes so that they could see armies of angels who were going to fight the battle for them, and they won because of what the angels did. And then those of you who attend CCSB know that we're going through a series right now in the Book of Daniel. And we all, I'm sure, remember the story of Daniel when he was thrown into the lion's den. And King Nebuchadnezzar raced down in the morning to see if he was still alive. And Daniel said, my God sent his angel. And he shut the mouth of the lion. So we don't want to minimize the importance of angels. They are definitely important, but they are not God. And they are not Jesus. And Jesus is the Savior. 
he is God. We'll talk a little bit more than, about them as we go through this passage. Now, I hope you read the passage three times. Remember, every week, read it a minimum of three times. You read the scriptures, I mean, you understand the scriptures when you read the scriptures. And as it has been said, don't read about the book, read the book. And read what God has written so that you can learn exactly what he wants you to know, because he's told us exactly what he wants us to know. So, beginning with cha verse, chapter 1, verse 4, it says, So Jesus, is talking about, became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Then it goes on to explain what this is. You'll see in verse 5, quote, to which of the angels did, did God ever say, You are my son. Jesus is God's son. And God never said that the angels were his son. He said, I'm your father, you're my son. And then he said, let the angels worship him, the son. Angels are to worship the son and not vice versa. We're not to worship the angels. Instead, they worship God and they worship Jesus. And we know this to be true. Those of us who have read or studied the book of Revelation know that the angels in heaven always worship God. They praise him continually. And in chapter 5 of Revelation, we read about angels thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 angels around the throne of Jesus and God singing. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and praise. They constantly praise and worship God and Jesus. So we don't worship the angels. We worship the one they worship, God and Jesus. I'm going to see if I can get rid of a little tiny bit of the sound. Uh, angels worship Jesus. We worship Jesus. He is the Son. He is God. And then it says angels are winds and servants, flames of fire. Angels are servants. They're fast as swift as the wind. They're as powerful as fire. They're powerful servants, but they're servants. And so he says, but you, about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. For righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness, hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you as an above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He says, angels are servants, but who is Jesus? Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. He's saying Jesus is the son of David who will rule on the throne forever over the kingdom of God on earth. <clears throat> Why would you worship his servant? Why would you not worship the king? He is the king. He is the Messiah. He is the promised one. And he is going to rule and reign forever and ever. The angels will serve forever, but he is the king. It doesn't make sense to worship the servant when you have the king. When we lived in Canada in 2001, Queen Elizabeth came to Hamilton. Hamilton was the next big city next to us. We were the last suburb of Toronto, and the next city uh, was Hamilton. And so Queen Elizabeth came in 2001 to Hamilton, and our daughter Kristen was a student at McMaster University at the time, and so she and her <coughs> friends all went to see the Queen. And of course, they lined the streets for miles as the motorcade came, motorcade with the Queen came down. This was before 9/11, <laughs> and so they could get fairly close to her. They could get through the car, and it was carrying her. And it was such excitement. Kristen came home and said, "Oh, I was so close. I could see her." Now, do you? That those same thousands of people would have lined the roads for the servant of the queen. Mm -hmm. Do you think if the queen's cook had been coming, <laughs> <laughs> or if her housemaid had been coming 
to Hamilton? Do you think all those thousands of people would have followed the motorcade down to see her? No. It was the queen. We have the king. Why would we worship his servants when we have the king who will be on his throne forever? And then he says, not only is he the son whom the angels worship, not only is he going to rule and reign the king forever, he said, then in verse 10 he says, in the beginning you laid the foundation of the earth, the heavens are the works of your hand. They will perish, but you remain. In other words, you're the creator. And you will never change. You are the immutable, eternal creator. Angels are created beings. Now, evidently, angels were around when the earth was created because Job chapter 38 tells us that... Um, let me see... The, uh, the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted with joy at the creation of the earth. They witnessed it because God had created them before he created the world. But the point is, they are created beings and he is the creator. So, why would you worship created beings? when you worship, we can worship the Creator. And then he says, um, uh, and to which of the angels did God ever say, verse 13, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Because God is promising Jesus, His Son, the King, the Creator, He is promising Him final victory where he will, it's like he will put his foot on top of all of his enemies. They will be his footstool. He will stomp them to the ground in victory because he, as the king of the earth, will reign as the king of the earth, victorious forever and ever over Satan and all his enemies. Did God ever say that to the angels? No. He said it to Jesus. So Jesus is superior to the angels in every way, so why would anyone worship angels? Angels, verse 14 tells us, are ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation. So we know that angels worship God, they worship Jesus, and we know that they minister to God, they are his servants, they are spirit beings, and we also see from this passage that they serve, the, they minister those who inherit salvation. Who's that? Yes. We inherit salvation, and so angels also minister to us. That's their job. They are servants of the living God. They serve Him, and they serve us as His children who will inherit salvation but they are not God, and they are not to be worshipped as God. Now, not only was that timely for back then, when people were beginning angel worship, to worship angels, it was also timely in our day. As you know, New Age, in the New Age belief system, angels are worshipped instead of God. Everyone becomes a god in New Age. And angels are worship. And one of the authors of the New Age movement said, um, said <clears throat> that one of the reasons that they worship angels is that angels are never judgmental. <laughs> Whatever you want. They are only compassionate. They are no, there are no rules, only compassion. And listen to this. Unconditional happiness, fun, and mirth. <laughs> now, that is the reason they worship angels and not God is because they have a totally unbiblical view of angels. Totally unbiblical. Because they don't understand 
that there are good angels who serve God, but there are also angels who rebelled against God in the beginning. They turned against him. Satan was their leader, and millions of angels followed him in evil, and they are at present engaged in that, that drama of evil against God, and they continue in that until the time that God cast them into the lake of fire forever and ever. And these people who worship these angels do not understand that these are the angels they are worshiping. It tells us in 1 Timothy 4 that they are following doctrines of demons. And this is, that, so their, Satan's goal is to lead people away from God, to follow him, because he does not want us to believe in Jesus Christ, to have our sins forgiven, and to go to heaven to be with God forever, because he is the arch enemy of God. He wants us instead to follow him to destruction. Misery loves company, and so he wants us all to join him. And so, those who are involved in the New Age movement, worshiping angels, are actually, they're worshiping angels, okay, but these angels are actually the demons of Satan. Now, maybe it seems like they're all compassion and fun and mirth, but what happens when they are suffering? Well, that's where Jesus comes in in a way that is so superior. But before we get there, the author says, after he tells us about this comparison of Jesus and angels, he says, verse chapter 2, verse 1, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. We have to be very focused on not drifting away from the truth. Now, those of you who have ever been fishing have probably at times either been in a canoe or a rowboat or a motorboat, turned off the motor and drifted down the river to fish. You know that feeling? You, you can turn that motor off and it's amazing how long you can drift and how far you can go when you drift <coughs> down the river. Simply going right with the current. He's saying we have to be careful that we don't drift away from the truth. What kinds of things make us, as women of faith, what makes us drift away from truth? How can we be in that boat going down the river and all of a sudden we come and say, whoa, what happened? How did I get here? What kinds of things can you think of? Outside influences. Outside influences, yes. You know, like what kind of outside influence? Just name one. Um, well, just being with a group of people who don't believe in God, and you get carried away in gossip uh, conversation, things like that. And then pretty soon it takes on a life of its own, doesn't it? I'm, I think busyness can be a part of that. I get so busy in these groups, I get so busy in things I'm doing, some of them very good, whatever. I'm just so busy that maybe I go days without reading the scriptures. I go days without spending time in prayer. And all of a sudden I wake up and say, what happened here? What happened to the vitality of my Christian faith? What happened to me here? And I just drifted and imperceptibly I moved away from what God wants to do in my life. And then all of a sudden I wake up and I really see the difference. What else? Yes. This is here I'm thinking of uh, people that I've known in the past who believe if you're good, you're you're okay. You know, if you're if you're a good person, you're okay. Yes. And and so many people get off track with that and follow other Isn't that the truth? Yeah. It's very, very easy. In fact, that's probably the number one way that people think they will get to heaven is by being good. And it's very possible for us, even as believers, to be involved in so many good works that we drift away from the source, Jesus Christ, and reading his word. God speaks to the truth to us as we read the word through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we gather together with other Christians, as we go, don't forsake the assembly of ourselves together on Sunday, if we're involved in church, then we are letting the truth infiltrate our lives 
so that we don't become distracted with activities, with good works, doing things like that. We instead want to keep our focus always on Jesus Christ. Now, a good thing about you all, you're here today. That tells me that you want your focus to be on Him. And that's one reason we have you read the Word. We have you read it over and over at least three times so that God can speak to you. That's how He speaks <coughs> through the truth. He says, so we need to be careful that we don't drift away. Because He said, if the message spoken by angels was uh, binding, and every disobedience received its uh, punishment, then we have to be careful because how will we escape if we ignore such great salvation? What he's saying is that the angels were involved in the giving of the law, Moses, the law of Moses. And the law of Moses, as you know, is very specific about punishment when you disobey the law. That's why they were were stoning the woman who was found caught in adultery. That was a very severe consequence to sin from the law of Moses. Also, you remember the law was given as Moses was on Mount Sinai getting the law from God. You remember that God said, don't let anybody come near the mountain. Don't let anybody touch it, a person or an animal, because if they do, they will die. The law had definite consequences for sin. So, if the law given by angels had such definite consequences, how will we escape if we neglect this great salvation given to us? What will happen to us if we drift away from the salvation that God has given to us? I tell you what will happen. We will lose reward. Much of the book of Hebrews is about the coming kingdom when Jesus Christ rules and reigns on earth forever and ever and into eternity. And if we drift away from that, it's not that we will lose our salvation, but we will lose the rewards that God has promised for us. And he said, this salvation is so great because, one, he says, it was announced to us by the Lord himself. He is the one who told it. And then, those who heard this, the apostles, the disciples, also told us about this great salvation. And God testified to it by signs and wonders, wonders and all kinds of miracles and gifts of the Spirit. In other words, when Jesus Christ came as Messiah, who had been promised, God wanted everyone to know, this is my son. And so Jesus, he validated the, who Jesus Christ is with all of the miracles that Jesus did. So that Jesus did things that only God could do. Why? Because he only is God. And God wanted everyone to recognize, this is my son. He is providing so great salvation. Pay attention to him and believe in him. So, he, Jesus did all of these miracles and God validated him as the one and only true son of God and savior of the world. You don't want to drift away from him. So, this is a warning. It's one of, the, it's the first of five warnings that are given to us in the book of Hebrews. Because as our author goes through showing us the superiority of who Jesus is, he wants to warn his readers never, ever lose sight of who Jesus is. There are, just as there are consequences for breaking the law, there are consequences for falling away from Jesus. So that's the warning there in the first four verses. And then he goes back again to Jesus to focus on who he is. And he talk, in these last verses that we're going to talk about today, he wants to show us the purpose of Jesus coming his destiny in the coming kingdom 
and his, to, his job to help those who will share in that destiny. People will share in the victory of Jesus, not angels. It's for us who are believers. Uh, as he says in verse 5, it's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, the coming kingdom about which we are speaking. And then, just as in chapter 1, he pulled from the Old Testament, I forgot to tell you, but in chapter 1, all of those the ways that he compared angels to Jesus, he used all Old Testament passages, primarily Psalms with which they would have been familiar, to draw this comparison between Jesus and angels. And here again, in chapter 2, verse 5, he draws on a psalm, Psalm 8, one with which they would have been familiar. Now let me just tell you something about Old Testament prophecies. Very often, an Old Testament prophecy was given to address a current situation that was going on right there. But there was a deeper meaning beyond that which would apply to Messiah. For example, in Isaiah chapter 9, when it says to us, a child is born to us, a son is given, that was referring to a child who was born then. But of course, we know that its ultimate meaning, it was given to tell us about Messiah who was coming. Well, this passage here in Psalm 8 was actually written that, uh, to, about us. You see, when we were created, as it says in Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let him rule over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth. That was God's plan, that we, created in the image of God, would rule over the earth and have dominion over all the earth. What happened? So we chose to sin. And in doing so, we brought a curse upon earth, the earth and of course upon us. And we lost that dominion, that rule that we would have had over the earth. And as we will see, which will be restored to us. And so now the author sees Psalm 8, not from that perspective of the dominion that we lost, but the dominion to whom that is, the one to whom that dominion is given. And who is that? Well, it's pretty obvious. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. Now, Jesus chose to be made lower than the angel. He didn't choose to be an angel. In the order of creation, remember that angels were created before human beings were created. And he did not, Jesus did not choose to be an angel. He could have, but he chose instead to join the human race so that he could fix that problem that we caused by our sin when we lost the dominion over the earth. So he became by his own choice, he joined the human race being made lower than the angels. And then it says, he's crowned with glory and honor. But it says, we don't, and everything's going to be put under him. But we don't see everything put under him now. We don't see him as having total victory now. But, in verse 9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor. And why is he crowned with glory and honor? Look at that next word. Why? What does it say in verse 9? Because he suffered death, that, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Why has God crowned Jesus with glory and honor? Because he chose to be made a little lower than the angels to join the human race so that he could die for the human race. And in doing so, he could lift the curse, he will lift the curse that is on the earth, but also on us as human beings because those of us who believe in him by faith 
then we'll have the sins forgiven. We will be with him forever and that we will be partakers of his glory. He, is, if it's easy to miss this, we see Jesus come, tells us about him. He was made a little lower, the angels now found the glory and honor. Why? Because he suffered death. Because he died for us. Because he chose to die for us to redeem us. That's why he's coming with glory and honor. And so it says in verse 10, <clears throat> in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. You see, Jesus came to die, and in doing so, he is leading this band of companions that were over here in verse 9. He is leading us to glory. Now this seems like it may be a bit of a sacrilegious comparison, but in my mind as I think of this, I think a little bit of a Pied Piper as he led the group, the people behind him. Jesus, our leader, is leading all of those who will follow him by faith. He is leading us up to glory. And he, it says that he is the perfect person to do this because he suffered. Why? Because we can't get there without suffering. We can't get to glory without going through suffering. Anyone who has ever lived on the face of planet Earth has suffered. And so, when Jesus chose to become a man, he chose to join us in our suffering. He chose to be a part of that suffering. So, as our leader, he can understand and lead us through our suffering. Why? Because he suffered. In making, he is holy. And in making us holy, he has to lead us through the path of suffering. And as we go through suffering, it's in those times that we become more like Jesus, right? When everything's going really well, it's easy to drift away. But when we are going through intense suffering, at those times, we have to lean on Him. And he has gone through it. And so we are all part of the same family, it says. Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters because he chose to become part of us, to die for us, so that the Holy One could make us holy and lead us to the Lord to be with him forever. And so, in verse 14, it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, ye too shared in them their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who has the power of death, the devil, that is the devil, and free them who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. You see, when Jesus died, he, at that point, was victorious over Satan because now Satan no longer has a hold on those who believe in Jesus Christ. Before he did. And before every person who ever died always won when they came to death, there was always this fear of death. What's beyond? What's going to happen to me? Have I done enough good works? Am I going to God? Am I not going to God? And there's this horrible fear of death. But Jesus came and put away that fear of death because we know where we're going. Now, we may not want to go through the process of death, but when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with us and we know exactly what's on the other side and it's a whole lot better. He will be taking us to glory. And so he freed us from all of that fear of death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So for the Christian, and if you've ever been around a Christian who died, you see that they are finally reaching glory 
Thine came home, and they are victorious. Finally, over Satan, he has no more hold on them. He can influence them never, ever again. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 16, for surely it's not the angels he helps, but it's Abraham's descendants, us. God didn't, Jesus didn't do all this for the angels. He did it all for us. Every single bit of it for us. And then I love this next verse that comes in, we see in verse 17. <clears throat> For this reason he had to make, be made like his brothers in every way, and sisters you could add, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, so that he might make atonement for the sin of the people. At this point, the author introduces to us the fact that Jesus is the high priest who was the ultimate high priest who was represented in the Old Testament. And he chose to go through the suffering that he went through. Why? So he could be a merciful and faithful high priest in representing us to God. So that when you suffer, he understands your suffering. And as a, your representative to God the Father, he can represent you perfectly because he understands it. Every ounce of pain and defeat. He went there before you. He suffered it for you. He chose to suffer it for you so that he could understand what humanity is all about. Just imagine if he had never suffered. Do you think he would have understood as well what we go through when we suffer? He chose not to be that way. He chose to suffer intense pain so he could understand our pain. That amazing way. He didn't have to, he's God. He didn't have to suffer, he chose to. So that he could mercifully and faithfully always represent us to God the Father and say that he could make atonement for us, forgive our sin, cover our sin and cover the wrath of God. So, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Whether you're suffering, or whether you're being tempted, he has been there. He's gone ahead of you, he understands, and he wants to help you. Absolutely amazing. Angels can't do that. Jesus can. Now, as I close, I'm going to read a little um, and, and something that refers to this by Dr. John Stott. He was a famous theologian, a prominent theologian. He has since gone to be with the Lord. But before that, I'm going to tell you my favorite story about Dr. John Stott. This complete aside, but I just want to tell you this is my very favorite story. Anytime I hear Dr. Stott, I think of this. Dr. Stott came to our church in Canada. And when he came to our church, we were in the process of redoing our platform for where Ron preached. And uh, so uh, Ron wanted the platform to come out further, so they, it was a very high platform, it was a large auditorium, sanctuary, and so they built a lower part to it and extended it out so that Ron felt like he could be closer to the audience as he was preaching. Well, Dr. Stott chose to be on the higher part when he preached. And so as Ron and I were sitting on the front row, and I remember, it was the Spirit of God, I know, who said to Ron, as Dr. Stott was preaching, uh, when Dr. Stott finishes, he's going to walk off the part of that platform. He's going to walk off the part where the stairs used to be, but not where they are now. In, in the process of doing this, so we had a temp temporary part of the stage built. So Ron said he sat there thinking, what am I going to do? I don't want to be the pastor of the church that killed John Stott. <laughs> i got to do something. 
So, when Dr. Stott finished preaching, he started walking off, and sure enough, he started walking where there were no stairs and the platform was about this high. And so Ron, on the first, at the same moment that Dr. Stott started, Ron got up and started and walked to him, and Dr. Stott fell exactly in his arms. <laughs> he caught him perfect. So whenever I think of Dr. John Stott, I can't help but remember that. <laughs> so Dr. Stott did not have to suffer quite as much as he would have, because he was old at that point. <laughs> I used that differently than I used to do. He is now in glory, but it didn't happen when he was at our church preaching. So. <laughs> But I want you to listen to what he said about Jesus suffering. <clears throat> he said, um, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who is immune to it? I've entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of Buddha. His legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, and the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time, after a while, I've had to turn away, and in imagination, I have instead turned to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross. Nails through his hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from forehead, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged into God-forsaken darkness. That is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in light of his. There's still a question mark against human suffering. But over it, if we boldly stamp another mark, the cross which symbolizes divine suffering, the cross of Christ is God's only self-justification self in such a world as ours. Because he suffered so intensely, we understand exactly whatever we suffer, and in doing so, because he understands it so well, he represents us mercifully to God the Father, asking God for mercy for us, his children. Now, as I told you, those who were the first readers of this book were suffering for their faith. And I told you that today there are 215 million Christians who are living in areas of the world where it's illegal for them to worship Jesus, the God who we've just been talking about. And so I told you that as we study this, we will talk about some of those people who are paying great prices for their faith because they choose to believe in Jesus Christ. And the one that I'm going to tell you about today is a little close to home. It actually, this story started in Jan on January 31st, 1991. It's a story of three missionary families who were in Panama, just a few miles from the Colombian border. And one night, terrorists from the organization FARC, which has been designated a terrorist organization by the United States government, these terrorists burst into these three different missionary homes and with gunshots they took the fathers, the three husbands of these missionary families and took them hostage. There were eight children among the families and some of them very young. And one of the wives said to the terrorists as they were taking her husband out of the house, she said, when will I see him again? And he said, you will see them soon. I'll see to it. And she said, I believed him. However, they took the, the terrorists took the men away, the missionary men, and they were never seen again. And I first heard about these missionaries when I was teaching my Bible study in Canada. 
and a lady from Hamilton, who was the sister of one of these men, Mark Rich, came to our Bible study. She knew we had lots of women, and she came to ask us if we would pray for these three missionaries and their families, because these women were doing everything they could, going to governments of Canada, of the U.S., to try to get these men released. And so our Bible study took that on to pray for these men. And then one Christmas in the 90s, I went home to Tulsa to see my family. And at there, uh, there was a cousin whom I had rarely seen in my life because she was 27 years younger than I am. And when she was born, I was having my first baby. And so I no longer went on family vacations with the family, so I, I really didn't know my cousin Janine. And so that night at the kitchen table, my parents' home, we were getting to know each other, and she was married, and when we were talking to her husband, Chad Mankins, I found out his father was one of those men. And that he had not seen his father since this happened. He said, my father's never met to me. He, he doesn't even know that I'm married. He doesn't know anything about me because he had not heard from, they had not heard anything from these men. They didn't know where they were. They had heard about spottings of them, so they felt like they were still alive at this point. But beyond that, there was no contact with the men themselves. Then a few years after that, after I met Chad, um, we had a, a Colombian, uh, I'm not sure if he was in the police department or the prison system, but he came to our church in Canada. And so Ron and I naturally asked him after church as we were talking to him, do you know about these missionaries? What has happened to them? And he said to us, he said, we're pretty sure they're dead. And so in 2001, after nine years of never hearing a word, one of them, one of the terrorists escaped from the group and he told the leaders of the mission very finally, they are dead. So while it was extremely sad news to the families, to the eight children, to the three widows, they at least had some closure to their suffering of wondering where their husbands were, were they okay, were they sick, did they have enough to eat, how were they? And so what they found out what happened was that as the terrorists were taking them through the jungle, they felt like they were being followed. They felt like the missionaries were a liability to them. And so they killed all three of them. Of course, their bones have never, none of their remains have ever been found and probably never will. But the wives all knew and said at their funeral that they knew that whatever suffering their husbands and fathers had been going through, they knew that Jesus was right there beside them holding their hand the entire time that they were going through. Well, what especially brought this to my mind, you see it right now, is that my cousin Janine and Chad have been married 22 years now. They've never been able to have children, so they, they were missionaries. They went back. My, my cousin was with, her family had been with, with the Bible translators. Chad's family was with um, New Tribes Mission. And Chad and Janine went to uh, Papua New Guinea, back with the very same mission that his dad had been with, his family had been with when they were captured. And they, my cousin there, is a translator to translate the scriptures into a language of people who have never heard before. And so because they had, could never have children in the U.S., they adopted three little black boys. And so they fit in perfectly in Papua New Guinea because they're exactly like all of the children there. And so this past uh, fall, they had to come home for medical needs. And while they were here, Janine was not feeling well. And to me, it's like I said, the age of my oldest son, 42. And it turned out she was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so she uh, was a high-risk pregnancy. She was in Dallas where they could take care of her. They could watch over her and watch her. And this Christmas, she had a little healthy baby. <laughs> and so uh, as I thought about this and as I 
gone through their story again and shed tears over what they went through. I thought uh, that sorrow comes for a season, but joy comes in the morning. And Jesus was with them all through their suffering. And now, Chad's mom, Nancy, came down to take care of this baby. And I thought it was a little bit about like Naomi and Ruth, that she held that little woman, that gift of God to the family. Because Jesus understood everything that they had suffered. And he rewarded them right in for that. So Jesus knows what you're going through. Nothing that you can face is greater than what he faced. So he can help us through everything, no matter what we go through. He's there for us. He's holding our hand, taking us through the suffering on the way to go right. Let's thank him. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you understand everything that we go through because you willingly gave your life to suffer for us. Lord, help us never to take this so great salvation lightly. Help us never to drift away from it. Help us to always be grateful for what you've done and what you are doing even now at this moment for us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for a wonderful Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.